For the best viewing and audio experience, we recommend using Chrome as your browser during the event and minimizing the number of open windows you may have. Welcome to today's webinar. We know your time is valuable and we appreciate you joining us. Our session will begin shortly, but let's cover a few housekeeping items before diving into the ABCs of RCV 2.0. Due to the number of attendees, we have muted participants to reduce any audio interference. For better viewing, you may expand or minimize your menu control panel by clicking on the tab located on the left edge of the panel. If you have technical issues, please use the chat feature located at the bottom of your control panel to send us a message, and we'll try to assist you. Attendees may also submit questions or comments using the chat feature. Staff will answer any questions Excuse me, staff will answer any questions that we are unable to address during the live session through follow-up correspondence. A recording of this event and associated materials will be placed on the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center website as soon as possible. For those unfamiliar with the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center, we provide a compilation of best practices and firsthand experiences from jurisdictions that have used this method of voting with a focus on election administration. Our website, rcvresources.org, and other content have been developed as educational tools for election administrators, policymakers, voters, candidates, and others. Projects like this and other resources are only possible because of the generosity of our donors and foundations. As a nonprofit organization, every dollar donated helps us reach our mission of providing accurate, reliable resources to people interested in ranked choice voting. If you wish to support our work, please head over to our website to make your donation and we'll put a link in the chat later on in the webinar. Today's presenters are yours truly, Rosemary Blizzard, Melissa Hall, Ryan Kirby, and Renee Rojas. Melissa is the Director of Education and Compliance and has been with the RCVRC since 2019. Prior to that, she was a public school educator. Ryan Kirby joins us from Maryland, where he was most recently the Chief of Staff for State Senator Cheryl Kagan. Ryan is currently a public policy specialist for the RCVRC. And I'm the current director and operation, director of operations and finance for the RCVRC. Before coming on board, I spent a combined 16 years as a local and state level elections administrator. Last but certainly not least is Renee Rojas. Renee is the technical program manager primarily for RCTAB and was previously with Benton County Washington Elections Office as their election systems manager. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Melissa to get us started. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Rosemary. So what is ranked choice voting? Ranked choice voting, or RCV, is a voting method where voters rank candidates in order of preference. Rather than only voting for only one candidate, voters rank candidates as first choice, second choice, third choice, and so on. Now, how the votes are counted depends on whether RCV is used in a single winner or multi-winner election, and I'll briefly cover these topics in a bit. So, ranked choice voting is actually an umbrella term for a couple different methods of election. A few associated terms for RCV are listed here. So, single winner ranked choice voting, which is the one that most people are familiar with, is also called instant runoff voting, or IRV. Multi-winner ranked choice voting is also called single transferable vote or STV. And in the past, these types of election have been called preferential voting or proportional representation. On the right, there is a sample RCV ballot for city council, and this allows voters to rank up to six choices. So how does RCV actually work? So here we have a short, really great voter education video from NYC Votes and the NYC Campaign Finance Board that shows how RCV works using a grid style ballot and the do's and don'ts of filling out the ballot. I do wanna note that this is just one of several RCV videos available from various jurisdictions. And we'll of course include uh, links to this video and others in the post webinar materials. So just to provide a little background, in New York City, voters used grid-style RCV ballots, and they had the option to rank up to five candidates based on state law and the voting equipment used. Keep in mind that you may need to adjust your, vo your volume excuse me, for the audio. So that said, let's 
Start the video. There's a new there's a new way for New Yorkers to have their say in city elections. A way that gives voters more choices and can lead to more diverse winners. It's called ranked choice voting. 74% of New York voters chose to use it in primary and special elections for city offices, mayor, public advocate, comptroller, borough president, and city council. You won't see ranked choice voting in general elections or elections for state or national offices. But in ranked choice voting elections, you can now rank up to five of your favorite candidates for each office. Here's how ranked choice voting works. On your ballot, you'll see candidates listed in rows and numbered rankings and columns. Pick your first choice and completely fill in the oval next to their name under the first column. Like always, you can just vote for your one favorite candidate and submit your ballot. But you might like several people. If you have a second choice, fill in the oval next to their name under the second column. Do the same thing for your third, fourth, and fifth choices if you have them. A few don'ts. Don't rank the same candidate more than once. It won't help them, and it takes away your chance to rank the others who are running. Don't give the same rank to multiple candidates. It could disqualify your ballot. Don't worry. This is a new process, and you can always ask a poll worker for help or for a new ballot if you make a mistake. So how do ballots get counted with ranked choice voting? If one candidate gets more than 50% of everyone's first choice votes, they win the election right away. That's it. If no candidate gets more than 50%, ballots will be counted in rounds. Round by round, the candidate with the fewest votes is eliminated. So if your top rated candidate is eliminated, your vote goes to your next highest choice. This keeps going until only two candidates remain. The person with the most votes wins. Ranked choice voting is already popular in many cities around the country because voters find that it helps more voices be heard. Now it's our turn. Get answers to your questions and learn more at nyccfb.info slash rcv. So, you know, as you can see, this video is a great way to visualize, you know, how the RCV process works. So just to summarize, you know, voters rank their choices in order of preference. Voters can choose to rank one or more candidates. Once votes are cast, ballots get counted by rounds and the candidate with the majority of votes wins. There are two types of RCV elections, single winner RCV and multi-winner RCV. Keep in mind that whether to use single winner or multi-winner RCV depends on the type of election. And as I mentioned earlier, single winner ranked choice voting is also known as instant runoff voting or IRV. For multi-winner ranked choice voting, single transferable vote or STV is also called proportional RCV and is considered best practice. Other forms are bottoms up and block preferential voting or BPV However, we at the RCVRC don't provide resources for those because of the way they operate. And of course, we can discuss these later, but for right now, it's outside of the scope of this webinar. So let's uh, dive into single winner first. Single winner RCV is used to elect a single candidate, like a mayor, governor, or president. RCV helps elect a candidate that better reflects the majority of voters in a single election even when several viable candidates are in the race. This type of RCV is most effective when a lot of uh, candidates, <clears throat> excuse me, are, are vying for a single race or a vote splitting is a threat. And on the right, there's a sample RCV ballot for mayor, and this allows voters to rank up to five choices. And of course, as mentioned in the video, voters rank their choices in order of preference. Once votes are cast, count up all the votes, and then check if anyone has a majority. If someone does have a majority, then the counting stops and that person wins. If no one has a majority, the candidate with the fewest votes is eliminated and their votes are transferred to their next choice. This round by round counting process continues until someone gets a majority. Of course, keep in mind that a voter's ballot does not simply exhaust 
when his or her first choice is defeated. Only one choice on each ballot is counted, and a voter's second or third choice is not used unless his or her first choice has already been eliminated. Now, multi-winner RCV is used to elect more than one candidate, like a city council or school board elected at large or state legislature. As I mentioned earlier, single transferable vote or proportional RCV is considered best practice when eliminating multiple candidates, excuse me, when electing multiple candidates using RCV. Proportional RCV results in proportional representation. So as you know, the phrase implies, proportional representation is representation that reflects the mix of views and interests of which the jurisdiction is made up. It stands in contrast to winner-take-all systems in which a majority, often a plurality of voters, controls the makeup of the whole body. There's wider representation, and most voters end up supporting a winning candidate. Proportional RCV uses larger, multi-seat districts, but fills the seats proportionately. The basic multi-winner process is similar to single-winner RCV, but it involves a threshold. So as with single-winner RCV, voters still rank candidates in order of preference. Then the first choice votes are counted to determine which candidates have exceeded the number of votes necessary to be elected, which is known as the quota or threshold of election. So to clarify, the threshold or quota is the percentage of the vote required for a candidate to be elected. It is relative to the number of seats being elected. So a candidate who reaches the you know, quota or threshold of the vote is elected. If a candidate has surplus votes, which are votes over that winning threshold, those votes will count for those voters' next choice. If no candidate reaches the winning threshold, the candidate with the fewest votes is eliminated. Those ballots for that, can that candidate will count for their next choice. And of course, this round-by-round -round elimination process continues until all seats are filled. I do want to note that this, of course, example is a simplified version to explain how multi-winner RCV works. Specific details are left out since it depends on the method used and is outside the scope of this webinar, which covers the basics. And of course, to learn more about those kinds of details, check out our website for more resources, including a webinar on understanding multi-winner RCV from 2018 which will also be included in the post webinar materials. So of course, you know, remember that every voter gets a single vote and the value of each vote is one. And of course, all of these are aspects that make the system proportional. So here we have a sample RCV ballot for city council. And of course, this is a grid style ballot and voters here have the option to rank up to six candidates. And keep in mind that whether using single winner or multi winner RCV on the ballot, the process is the same for the voters. Voters rank their choices and preference. And with that, I will pass it off to my colleague, Ryan. Thanks, Melissa, and thanks everyone for joining us today. So where is RCV being used? On the slide, you see a slightly modified map from Fair Vote and Fair Vote Illinois. There are currently 52 cities, one county, and two states that will use RCV in their next election. Six states use RCV for their overseas and military voters for runoffs, and another six states use RCV in the Democratic presidential primary. Some prominent examples of RCV use include Maine, which first used it in 2018 for state and federal primary elections and general elections for Congress, Alaska, which will use RCV for all statewide and federal general elections this year, New York City, which Melissa mentioned, used RCV last year for the first time in the city primary elections. And New York City also used our RCV tabulation software, RCTAB, which Renee will discuss later on in the presentation. Uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts adopted proportional representation back in 1940. These are just some examples, and we will be sure to include the full list of RCV uses in the research document after the webinar. Uh, some non-governmental RCV uses, RCV is used in more than just government elections. It has broad uses in elections or decision-making for non-governmental organizations. In case you hadn't heard, the Oscars were held this past weekend, and it is actually one of the most notable private uses of RCV. The Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences uses proportional multi-winner RCV to award the Oscars and the single-winner form of RCV for best picture. 
A couple other organizations that use RCV include the American Parliamentary Debate Association, the American Psychological Association, the National Organization for Women, and more than 95 college campuses across the country, from American University to the University of Wyoming. These are just a few examples, but it is helpful to know how RCV is used as a way of getting more information from voters, whether they are members of an organization or students on a college campus. So why do jurisdictions adopt ranked choice voting? Some of the pros and the benefits is that it reduces election costs and campaign costs. By using RCV, runoff elections, which tend to have a lower turnout than election day, are no longer needed because RCV allows voters to provide more information about their preferences. Additionally, campaigns don't have to worry about a runoff election, which can save them money and time. In some cases, RCV can be used to eliminate primaries, which can further reduce costs for election administrators and campaigns. RCV also can increase civility in campaigns. In non-ranked choice voting elections, candidates often turn to mudslinging by attacking an opponent's character instead of sharing their positive vision with voters. With ranked choice voting, candidates do best when they reach out positively to as many voters as possible, including those supporting their opponents. According to a 2018 exit poll by Fair Vote in Santa Fe, 67% of respondents believed the tone of their first mayoral election with RCV was more positive than prior mayoral elections. And again, this poll we mentioned will be linked in the list of resources after the webinar, so you can dive into some of the specifics if you like. Uh, it also promotes fair representation. Legislatures elected by a winner-take-all method may lead to distortions in partisan representation, the entrenchment of incumbents in safe seats, regional polarization, and the low representation of women and racial and ethnic minorities. RCV can help end the cycle of gerrymandering and create competitive elections in which every vote counts. It has also been shown to help increase representation of more women and people of color. And finally, given the long lead times for mailing ballots overseas, RCV also supports military and overseas voters to ensure their voices can be heard in their communities back home. And finally, it helps avoid vote splitting and weak plurality results. It mitigates the spoiler effect, which refers to elections in which two or more candidates with similar political ideologies split a portion of the electorate, leading another candidate to win with the plurality of the vote. The spoiler effect has long been a point of contention in close political contests. And in races with numerous candidates, the winner frequently receives less than 50% of the vote. That means that a majority of voters favored somebody else. Ranked choice voting allows these voters to express their true preferences rather than trying to vote strategically and elects winners with broader support. Now, there are some concerns that we hear about ranked choice voting. A change for voters when they head to the polls. Some voters may not understand the counting system or a change from first round plurality winner. And some low information voters may make mistakes with the new ballot format. And election night results will not necessarily reflect final results. But voters are smart. The same exit poll from Santa Fe showed that more than 84% of respondents said the ballot was not at all confusing or not too confusing. Additionally, uh, some voters need to evaluate more candidates at once. It does require voters to learn more about the candidates, and this may be challenging when there are a lot of candidates, but that is part of voter education. It also incentivizes voters to learn and learn about and consider all of their options on the ballot. Jurisdictions can also set limits on the number of rankings on a ballot, which can help voters and it can help limit the size of their ballot. An eventual winner does not necessarily have a majority of first round votes. As ballots are exhausted, meaning they have run out of rankings that are still in the race, the majority is only determined by active ballots, not all ballots cast. While that can happen, this result is more representative as a whole because voters were able to express a more complete list of preferences between all the candidates. And finally, voting equipment. Counting can be challenging on legacy systems and the RCV ballot layout won't necessarily fit on current voting equipment. But RCV has been used before and it can be done. My colleague Renee will talk about some of the benefits, some of the specifics with voting equipment but the simple fact is that it can and has been done as we've seen it's being used in jurisdictions across the country. So can my jurisdiction adopt ranked choice voting? So here are some items to consider. What are your goals with ranked choice voting? Are you trying to achieve better representation, eliminate runoffs? Are you trying to reduce negative campaigning? These are some questions to consider or to help you understand why you want to R RCV and help create your strategic plan. What offices would use ranked choice voting? Would this entail a single winner or a multi-winner approach? Is it a state bill that provides county and municipal governments with the option to adopt ranked choice voting? What changes would be needed to state or local statutes? Is RCV allowed by state statute? 
For example, in Austin, Texas, they have approved ranked choice voting for use in elections, but Texas law has a narrow definition of a majority winner that prevents it from going into effect. And how are ballots counted? Are they counted by machines or are they done via hand count? How are they centralized? These are just some of the questions to think about when you're looking at whether or not your jurisdiction can adopt ranked choice voting. One of the best places to start is with our RCV maps. It's a 50 state plus DC assessment of RCV capability. And it was produced last year and it will be updated in the future. And it's a great starting point to get information about the election process and, uh, and one of the many resources that the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center provides. And with that, I will uh, toss it off to Rosemary. Thanks, Ryan. I will try to stay within my allotted time, but as I was working on notes for this, this particular section, I had the thought that this implementation of RCV and its impact on election administration could possibly be its own webinar. And if my comms director wasn't listening before now, I guarantee her ears just perked up. Kelly, we'll talk later. Uh, please forgive me if I get long winded because I could go for hours on this. This section is going to get a little more into the idea of implementation and what that will look like for elections administrators. And I'll already apologize as a former administrator, I immediately go into training mode. So if I make a reference that it seems as though I'm talking to elections administrator, I apologize. I'm trying to cover the entire group. But before we kind of get into the nitty gritty of it, I want to be very clear that this is not meant to be an exhaustive list um, at risk of telling my age. If you remember the old Circus of the Stars show that was on every year, there was always a celebrity that did the, the whole spinning plates routine. And I can't think of a better analogy as to how that describes a little bit of what it's like to administer an election. So you start out kind of slow, you got one or two plates going, and, and then as you get to election day, you may have 10 or 12, 14 or 15, depending on the election. And as with anything, whether it's administering elections or spinning plates, you know, there's skill involved, there's practices involved, policies, and then sometimes uh, thankfully, there's always a little bit of luck that goes into having a successful election. So as we talk about these things, I just I don't want it to be misunderstood that everything I talk about is the only thing that has to be considered when implementing RCV. Each jurisdiction, each election, for that matter, tends to have its own little personality. Um, so each of these things may have their own little nuances that make it different from its neighbors or any previous election. So those are things that have to be taken into account as well. What type of election are we dealing with? Presidential, municipal, uh, the size of the jurisdiction, how you do things in New York City is going to be vastly different than how you might do things in East Point, Michigan. Voter demographics, do you have a, a large educated population of voters, a, maybe a mix of education levels? Things like that all have to be considered when doing elections in general let alone implementing uh, ranked choice voting. And implementing RCV as an election method, the one thing I do want to stress is for the election administrators in the, who may be in attendance is the normal things that happen with elections are still going to continue to happen. So a lot of times when people start thinking about incorporating ranked choice voting, we get a, oh my gosh, how much am I going to have to change? Well, the answer is, there are some things that have to be changed, yes, but the natural flow of an election will continue as it pretty much always has. Budget committees still have to meet, be met, or their requirements still have to be met, setting budgets. Candidates still have to file for their contests. Ballots must still be designed and printed. Uh, election equipment has to be programmed and tested. Deadlines and other issues have to be met. So. Does the structure of the election change? Not really. Do certain aspects of it change? Absolutely. And that's what we're going to sort of focus on as we get a little further down the road. Um, and a bigger takeaway is implementation is not insurmountable. It can be done. It has been done. And with a lot of work and careful planning, it can continue to be done. So. That's the thing that I want us to get out of this particular section of the webinar, if nothing else. And just to address the quotation I have here, 
I won't even attempt to pronounce the author's name, but I, it struck me because this is everybody is able to make plans. Few people can implement them. And election administrators are masters at logistics and implementation. These people are the best resource out there for understanding elections in general and ultimately expanding the use of RCV across the country. So elections administrators are those few people that the author of this quotation was, was really, I think he may not have realized it, but that, that's the type of person that I think he may have had in mind. So just a thought there as we move on. Um, so find your buttons, Rosemary. So the areas we're going to talk about that may have a direct impact from moving from just a standard election, general plurality election over to an RCV type uh, budgeting, which is needs versus wants, ballot design, what's possible and what's required, tabulation rules and resources. How do we count the darn thing? Now, Renee Rojas is going to go into this a little bit later in more detail, but there are a couple of points I wanted to make and we'll do so in just a few minutes. And then voter education, how to reach as many people as possible. So we'll start with budget, needs versus wants. So there's a couple of places, and I tend to think of budgets, especially where RCV implementation is concerned, is there's some very likely impacts, and then there's some supplemental impacts, and I'll explain what I mean by that. The most likely impacts to the budget is additional ballot costs, such as coding or longer ballots, which may in turn increase postage costs. Now, RCV contests, depending on the number, the size, and the format, can eat up more real estate on the ballot than what we're accustomed to. And I wish we could find a way around that. We're still working on that idea, but we haven't quite figured out how to manage that a little bit. So ballot costs potentially can go up and should be considered along with postage and, and uh, materials used to move ballots from point to point. Um, software or voting equipment system upgrades may also be of an issue. Now I'm going to do a shameless plug for our RCV maps. I think Ryan mentioned it and I believe Renee will mention it as well. Uh, the it is a reports for all 50 states plus DC. It looks at each state's current position with regards to voting equipment and how RCV implementation might look. Um, the key point is, and I was a little surprised myself when we were working through this project, is don't immediately assume that a jurisdiction has to completely overhaul their election system. There are a few. But the majority there are either using equipment that is already capable and then there's a, a good portion that are using equipment that with some workarounds, maybe the use of RC tab that can at this point in time implement RCV. Um, so the supplemental, what do I mean by supplemental? Well, supplemental is sort of a cross between if your budget committee is in a really good mood and gives you all of the resources possible to do whatever type of voter education you want to do, poll worker training you want to do, or add personnel to your office, certainly take advantage of the resources. But if your if the budget committee was like the budget committees I used to work with, um, this the term blood out of a turnip ring of any bells. So I consider these impacts on budget to be somewhat supplemental simply because they don't have to break the bank. You can do, or excuse me, voter education can be done, candidate education, working with the media can be done without commercials and radio spots. And, and certainly those things are nice, but not absolutely required. Training poll workers, again, there may be an initial need to do that with the implementation of RCV the first election or so. But we've found through my own experience, as well as in my role here with the RCVRC, is that those initial implementation hits in terms of outreach and education, getting poll workers and precinct officials up to speed, adding additional personnel, those costs either tend to be absorbed or fade a little over time, because as you get further and further away from implementation, 
it becomes a more natural state for the voters and there's not quite as much energy around this new thing. Uh, so yes, there are some hits, just to summarize, there are some hits with ballots and, and other issues, but then as far as the initial impacts of voter education and poll worker training, those things can disperse over time. Moving on to ballot design, and you've already seen a couple of examples of these. I think Melissa talked a little bit about them as well. But from the implementation side of things, current ballot guidelines have to be considered what's allowed by the controlling jurisdiction. Uh, the lim limitations of equipment and software have to be considered when programming and coding. The number of contests and types of uh, RCV elections or methods that are being used will determine a lot about how the ballots are designed in any given jurisdiction. Uh, by and large, the two most common styles of ballots used with RCV are either the grid style, which I think is, and I'm having trouble seeing because I don't have my reading glasses on, um, would be the example at the top of the slide, and, or the column style, which is the middle or uh, bottom example. Research seems to suggest um, that voters tend to respond better or find it easier to use the grid style. Uh, I won't say that it's 100%, but they're overwhelmingly, they tend to, to prefer that version over the column. But given whatever limitations a jurisdiction may have or whatever specific um, issues a jurisdiction may have, because remember, every jurisdiction and election is a little different. Uh, there may be some reasons why the column style would be used. Uh, paper size has to be considered. I've already talked a little bit about that in the budget side of things of does eat up a little bit more real estate than we're accustomed to. And then, of course, larger paper or more paper may also affect any kind of containers that are used to mail ballots as well as postage. And this, I want to talk a little bit about setting up the rules for tabulating. Um, again, I don't want to get too much into Renee's side of things, but I um, want to talk a little bit about how understanding, in my opinion, and this is my definition, I consider tabulating results as interpreting the ballots. So you have to tell the machines how to interpret the, the marks on the ballots in order to get a count basically. Um, that's a very simplistic view of it, I, I admit. Um, but understanding the rules for tabulating and how the ranked choice voting election is going to be set up in a given jurisdiction, it's directly going to affect ballot design and setup. You got to know how to put it put on the ballot and how to set up the uh, coding for the machines. It is definitely related to logic and accuracy testing. Now, logic and accuracy testing, and it may be called something different in different places. That's what we always called it when we were using it. Um, logic and accuracy testing should already be in place. That's not anything new. At least I hope it's not new. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, it's, it's simply taking before the election, taking the ballots uh, and marking a test deck with a known outcome running it through the machines in whatever method the machine requires, tabulating it all the way through to getting a count. And in theory, the count that the machine produces will match the known outcome that the tester set up initially. The added part of that where ranked choice voting is concerned is whatever method the uh, jurisdiction has opted to do to tabulate a ranked choice voting, whether it's the equipment they already have, whether it's RC tab, whether it's by hand, is that portion of figuring out how the, the test deck is to be interpreted has to be added to the already existing logic and accuracy testing. So we're just adding a, a step or two here, not recreating the wheel. Understanding the rules for tabulating an RCV election also help determine voter intent when tabulating in general on election night and the days after certifying and other any other post-election processes, recounts, etc. Um, and then as this is a good segue into my last particular section is knowing how ballots will be tabulated or interpreted 
will impact your voter education efforts. And let's talk a little bit about voter education. <clears throat> the voter education is a key component of a successful RCV implementation. It does not have to be expensive or extravagant. It does not have to be overly complicated. It doesn't have to be something to be dreaded. It does need to be planned, especially if it's a new implementation, obviously. And adva taking advantage of every resource available is probably the best advice I would give to any jurisdiction that is implementing RCV for the first or first few times. So what is voter education? Well, it's outreach. Um, we, I think we take for granted what that is because well, it seems to be pretty self-explanatory, educate your voters, but how? Obviously, we've seen an example from Melissa, a commercial that was produced by a group out of New York City. There were several examples of that. Uh, we've got other examples on our website and we'll be adding others. But if you're not fortunate enough to be able to afford uh, a video or radio or TV ads or whatever, you know, what do you do? Well, we've seen examples, um, and I'll go through these very quickly. Uh, Minneapolis uses their social media, web chats. They were able to do some videos. They did handouts. They did a voter information guide that was mailed to voters. Uh, we'll just a note there that post-election survey uh, indicated that for the people asked, that it was considered one of the more effective tools for learning about RCV. I've got two theories on that. One, I, having talked to the folks in Minneapolis, they are fantastic at their jobs and they probably put together an amazing information guide, which of course is, it would be popular. But I also think that that guide was able to reach voters in the privacy of their homes where they could at their own time, in their own time frame, at their own pace, study or learn about ranked choice voting. We all know as humans, we are not the, um, we tend to avoid situations that put us in uh, places where we feel like we may be a burden or we may be uh, standing out in groups that we don't want to stand out in. So I really believe the popularity of God or getting information to voters in their own homes, such as this type of guide, probably gave voters a chance to learn without feeling as though they were standing out or, or being seen as not educated enough. Um, Minneapolis also, this is an example of one of their handouts, and I wanted to point it out specifically because a lot of the instructions that are seen here um, mimic or probably are an exact copy the instructions that are at the top of the ballot. And as both a former educator and a former administrator, any time and more times you can get the same images in front of voters, the more likely they are to understand what the images are saying and uh, fill out their ballots correctly. Maine, as an example, which is a statewide example for us, uh, did their first RCV election on Tuesday, June 12th, 2018, and then also since then have successfully conducted several RCV elections, including the first RCV presidential election in 2020. Uh, their method of outreach was producing voter FAQs. They also did some videos. I won't show it to you, but um, we'll certainly provide the links to that video in our resources document. Um, they also took advantage of advocacy groups working in tandem to conduct door-to-door -door educational campaigns. So sometimes just sitting down, and I know I've personally had the experience, and I've talked to a lot of people who've had a similar, is when you first bring up ranked choice voting, they kind of look at you a little funny, like, I don't quite know what you're talking about. But when you explain it to them a few minutes later, they're like, oh, well, I wonder why we don't already do that. So sometimes just sitting down face to face is a good outreach method. And the last example that I'll use, um, this is, and, and I freely admit that this example has some age on it. It is from 2007, Hendersonville, North Carolina, which is located in southwestern North Carolina uh, near Asheville for reference 
did, they called it IRV at the time, had three months to get the word out, so to speak, for a population of about 13,000. So that's a small town. Uh, but the reason why I put this example in here is purely because of the date and some of the non-conventional methods that they used to get the word out. 2007, while yes, social media in for some form or fashion did exist at that point in time, it was certainly not as mainstream as it is today. And so I wanted to bring out the fact that between this particular example, the fact that Cambridge, Massachusetts has used ranked choice voting for years um, and, and other areas that voter education and outreach programs can be done uh, without the benefit of social media and some of the flashier versions of, of getting uh, information to people that we have today. What the folks in Hendersonville, North Carolina did, they had a, a booth at a particular festival that has quite a bit of attendance by the locals. The residential associations conducted forums. They did produce a website, used local media. They had help from outside sources, just like we saw with Maine. And they even went sort of non-conventionally, uh, did a flyer and sample ballot, put in the water or utility bill for folks in the town as well. So just, again, there is, as they say, more than one way to um, solve a problem. And obviously, these are some examples of larger cities, small towns, an entire state doing a voter education and outreach with the resources that they have. And certainly the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center is very much willing to work with any jurisdiction to help them assess what the best voter education outreach plan might be. And there's a ton of other uh, groups out there as well. Democracy Rising comes to mind that can also assist with this process. Um, so I think I'm going to wrap up now because I think I have gone on far longer than I should have. And I'm going to turn it over to Renee Rojas to uh, cover tabulation in a bit more in depth and wrap us up for our question and answer period. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Rosemary. My name is uh, Renee Rojas and I'm the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center's Technical Project Manager. I've been involved in, with elections for the last 10 years and I'll be discussing election voting systems, tabulation and results, RC tab, and briefly touch on some resources we offer at the Resource Center, including some already presented. Now, a voting system can be defined as the equipment and software a jurisdiction uses to create an election, create ballots, and tabulate results. There are five major voting system vendors in the US each with varying capabilities when it comes to ranked choice voting. While they each have different strengths and weaknesses, all modern iterations of these vendor software can be used to conduct a ranked choice voting election. The vendors we'll be discussing are Election Systems and Software, also known as ESNS, Dominion Voting Systems, Heart InterCivic, Unison Voting Solutions, and ClearBallot. Let's begin by taking a look at some sample RCV ballots each of these vendors produce. The first vendor we have on the screen is ESNS with two ballot styles. On the left, we have a grid sample ballot used in Maine's 2018 Democratic primary election. You'll notice the grid style ballot lists candidates and rankings in a grid fashion. And on the right is ESNS's column style sample ballot from the 2017 City of Minneapolis general election. You'll notice candidates and rankings are laid out in columns. ESNS's voting system, Electionware, can support RCV ballots of up to 23 rankings. However, Electionware currently only supports single winner contests without the use of a third party add on. Next up, we have Dominion Voting Systems and Heart Inner Civic. On the left, we have a sample grid style ballot from Santa Fe's 2018 municipal election. Dominion's Democracy Suite, with the addition of Dominion's RCV add on, can produce and tabulate RCV ballots of up to 10 rankings, as well as supporting single winner races and multi-winner races. Next, on the right, we have a sample grid style ballot from Hart InterCivic. Hart's Verity system has an RCV suite that can create ballots with up to six rankings in a grid style ballot. However, it can only tabulate the first round without third party support. Finally, we have Unison Voting Solution and ClearBallot. Unison is one of the smaller vendors out there, but 
OpenElect offers an RCV suite that can create rank choice selections up to three rankings as shown on the ballot on the left. This is only a mock-up image, but an interesting tidbit is that Unison, Unison's voting suite, OpenElect, is currently the only voting system that has EA that an EA certified, EAC certified RCV suite. Finally, we have the newest vendor on the list, ClearBallot. ClearBallot is currently working on developing an RCV suite, but has no ballot markups available at this time. Each of these voting systems has its pros and cons when looking at the features offered, and it's typically up to the local or state jurisdiction to select which system they prefer. Moving on, we'll now discuss tabulation and results reporting in a ranked choice voting election. Melissa covered some of the basics of tabulating a ranked choice voting election, but uh, I'll go over some specifics. Races are tabulated in rounds, and tabulation will need to be centralized to one location for the round by round count. This will help deliver an accurate and clear result, which is vital in not just an RCV election, but all elections. Centralized tabulation uses what's known as a cast vote record, or CVR. CVRs are a digital representation of all the votes cast in an election and are required to run an RCV round by round count with RCV counting software. If CVRs are not available, RCV elections must be hand counted. This brings us to winning thresholds, which Melissa, Melissa kind of touched on. In a single winner contest, a candidate must receive 50% of the vote in the first round or preceding rounds. For a multi-winner ranked choice voting election, the threshold changes based on how many candidates are to be elected. For example, if three seats are being filled, the threshold of the election is 25% plus one vote. In that case, this would be the smallest number of votes that three candidates can get, but four candidates cannot. For four seats, each candidate must get 20% of the vote plus one vote, which is the smallest number of votes that four candidates can get, but not five. Additionally, with RCV, the results reporting timeline will take longer than a plurality election. In fact, election night reporting varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. For example, San Francisco reports its first round results at 8.45 p.m. on election night, followed by second round counts at 9.30. However, results are not finalized until the election is certified almost a full month after election night. Along that line, visualizations are also invaluable when displaying round by round results, as it helps the voter understand what happened with their vote in each round. If you're curious about what RCV results look like, there's a few examples at the top of this slide from RCViz. RCViz is a tool for visualizing ranked choice voting election results. I highly recommend checking it out uh, the link will be included in the reference material after this presentation, and RCViz has examples of round-by-round -round counting and more. I mentioned that not all voting systems could tabulate a ranked choice voting election. However, the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center, in conjunction with the developmental group Brightspots, has developed a software add-on to help called RCTAB. RCTAB, formerly known as the Ranked Choice Voting Universal Tabulator, was created in 2019 to help jurisdictions tabulate results in a Ranked Choice voting election. RCTAB uses CVR files to tally votes, which can be exported from all the major vendors we discussed earlier. After a cast vote record is uploaded into RCTAB, jurisdiction rules are set, such as the type of election being conducted, winning rules, thresholds, and etc., and then the tabulation is started. Once a winner is determined, RCTAB produces three result files, which can be used in conjunction with RCViz to visually display the results for voters. Now, the best part about RCTAB is that it's free to use, and if you're in a jurisdiction required to conduct a ranked choice voting election, and you lack the resources to pay for an additional add-on or upgraded voting suite, RCTAB is here to help. And the, the link for all these slides will be presented in the reference material. Now, RCTAB isn't the only resource we offer to the public and administrators alike. For example, we have RCV Maps, which Ryan discussed earlier in the presentation. To refresh, RCV Maps offers information on states and their readiness to implement ranked choice voting. And if you're curious about how prepared your state is for a ranked choice voting election, then be sure to check out our interactive RCV Maps and the assessment for your state. Additionally, we're building a library of RCV resources for ele election administrators and voters alike. Within our library, you'll find more information on everything RCV related, 
from election planning to legislation to best practices and RCV implementation. In fact, some of the content you've seen here today was pulled from our library, and it's in the process of growing every day. As we add content and improve its functionality, we hope to see the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center become the premier place for Ranked Choice voting information. Finally, if you have more questions or are looking into conducting an RCV election, the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center is available to assist with Ranked Choice Voting Legislation, Implementation, and Tabulation. Consulation, consultation is available free of charge, and the staff at the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center has collectively over a decade's worth of election experience across the U.S. to pull from. Remember, we're here to help. Thank you, Renee. Uh, this is Rosemary again. And just before we um, go into our Q. My apologies. Uh, I sent the group a text to remind them to turn their microphones back on, and I did not heed my own advice. So my apologies. Is the sound back by chance? Can someone in the chat let me know what's going on? Yeah, I can hear you, Rosemary. This is Ryan. Okay, good, 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 good. Sorry, <laughs> my apologies. Um, I'm going to place our uh, the link that we mentioned earlier at the beginning in our chat, and then we're going to go ahead and start our question and answer section because we are running up on about um, eight minutes left before we're going to turn everything off. If you have any questions that we do not get to uh, today, we certainly please email us at info at rcvresources.org and we will be happy to get staff to answer those questions and make them a part of our Q&A document that we will send out with all of our other resources to the registrants and attendees for today as well as place it on our, on our website. All right, so um, if the panelists will turn on their cameras, we'll do a quick, as much as we can, Q&A and um, go from there. And I will take my own advice. Okay, so first question, how do you recommend tabulation, tabulating races that cut across multiple tabulation jurisdictions? Renee, you wanna take that one? Yeah, sure, I, I can take that question. Um, I uh, was actually an election supervisor that dealt with multiple jurisdictions. And when that scenario came across, we would usually uh, have the county with the majority of voters um, in their you know, county or jurisdiction take the lead on that. And for something like that, while we never conducted a ranked choice voting election in uh, Washington state, or well, in my, my area, I imagine it would go somewhere along those lines where one county would take the lead and be responsible for the centralization of those, um, those cast vote records and tabulation. And I imagine that's how it goes with across the state if we were to have a statewide ranked choice voting election. Yeah, and I can say that in the statewide races, uh, there's usually some centralizing point of the information. Uh, I think Maine does centralization. Now, obviously, some states geographically, that would be a nightmare. Uh, Maine is fortunately fairly small and can do that. But at some point, and that is one of the things about ranked choice voting that has to be considered, is there has to be some centralization, whether it's at a single point in a state or, as you suggested, one county sort of take the lead on that. Thank you. 
Uh, next question. And if any of the panelists want to monitor the chat along with me to, to get this moving so we can get as many in as possible, that would be great. And as usual, our chat has not disappointed. Uh, it's been quite active. Uh, what is involved in a third party support for a jurisdiction using heart? And I, I can answer this one again, Rosemary. Um, when I, when I mentioned third party support, I was really, uh, alluding to the fact of the use of RC tab. The, the great mm -hmm. part about RC tab is that it, it is able to take the cash vote records from all the major vendors I discussed and tabulate those results. Um, even though heart can only do the first round. I would recommend just exporting the CVR for, I mean, you can select the race you want to tabulate in RC tab. In fact, it only does one at a time. So for something like using heart, you would export that CVR based off of their instructions, uh, throw it into RC tab, set your rules, and it would tabulate the race for you, giving you each round. Okay. Um, let's see, what else have we got here? Um... And certainly, if any questions have come to mind since we have finished presentations, please uh, add those to the chat. Um, I did want to let's see. I think it was Jody who talked about training extensively in every election. There's always something that gets changed or learned in many different ways. Absolutely, 100%. Uh, it, the minute we finished an election, it was what did we learn from this last go round, and what can we do better? So. You are absolutely right. Training is an ongoing process, whether it, regardless of method, it is something that is 100% ongoing 24 hours a day, practically. Rosemary, I saw a question from uh, Henry uh, Rowland, if I'm pronouncing that mm -hmm. correctly, asking, uh, do RCV, RC personnel ever join a state level RCV coalition in their co consultant efforts? Um, and so I can answer that a little bit. Uh, working with Chris Hughes, our policy director, uh, we kind of take an informational stance because of our nonprofit status. Um, we don't engage in advocacy in the same way, but we can provide uh, information to election administrators in a nonpartisan sense that uh, is, is typically really helpful, particularly when it comes to implementation uh, and how, how RCV can be implemented in that jurisdiction. Right. Okay. Um, we have another question that says, do you recommend releasing the first round of tabulation and then other rounds later or releasing the current final winner as results come in? Um, I would have to, I sort of go back and forth on that a little bit. Uh, you know, I am accustomed to releasing what we consider unofficial results election night. And certainly that in a ranked choice voting scenario, that's going to be who got what first choice votes. Um, and then, you know, as ballots come in, whether it be absentee, UACAVA, same, same but different. Um, and then other ballots that may still be coming in or meeting deadlines, you know, that's going to play a potential role too. So as far as like an official recommendation by the organization, I don't know that we have put anything down on paper yet. Ryan, you may have some insight into that working in policy, uh, but obviously I don't have any issue personally with the first round of counting. I mean, that's very much similar to the way we do it now in plurality setup. Yeah, I don't think we have an official policy on that, um, but we can definitely include that uh, more thorough answer in our Q&A document. But I think, you know, kind of trying to keep in, in touch with the, the, current system of releasing unofficial results when we have them for the first round and mm -hmm. then when possible releasing information when it's available. Um, right. And again, as, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Renee. I was just going to add, you know, as, as a former administrator, it, it's so important to produce something I feel on election night. Um, so I, I would agree with that, that first round results. I mean, like I said, we, we don't have a former policy here at the ranked choice voting resource center, but I understand the the excitement around elections, and I think as long as you state it's unofficial first round results, and that it could change as more votes are tallied, I, I do kind of feel like that might be the best practice. Right, right, and, and it is going to depend a little bit on just like what I said. Every election, every jurisdiction is a little bit different. What works for one may not work for another. Uh, so we'll sort of play uh, play it by ear, as they say. Um, I see um, a couple of questions pop up in the Q&A. 
portion only. It says, uh, what are the differences between STAR and RCV tabulating? And one that kind of expands more, is STAR more comprehensive in its tabulations? I am aware of STAR voting. I will be, you know, quite frankly, frank here and, and say that I don't know enough about it to offer any sort of educated opinion. Um, what I do know doesn't resonate with me, but that is just simply, it's an uneducated opinion on that particular issue. I kind of, I mean, I agree with that too. I need to look more into it, but from what I, um, what I can remember and what I've looked into, it's, I think people score each candidate from like zero to five. Um, mm -hmm. And then of course those mm -hmm. scores are, you know, tallied. And if I believe correctly, they determine like a top two kind of situation. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, you score and then you have that kind of automatic runoff. Um, and then that's about where I'm at with that. We need to look more into that. Um, well, that is something that's definitely interesting that we should uh, have a little more information on. So I don't know if anyone else has anything else to add on that, but we can always expand upon that, of course, in the Q&A as well. Right. And I will say there are as many ways to do something as there are things to do. And while obviously there's probably no one one perfect answer for how to make elections in this country better, um, certainly, you know, our focus is going to be on ranked choice voting and the best practices for implementing it. Um, and we are at uh, an hour. We have we are actually at an hour and a minute. And certainly we want to be cognizant of people's times and their commitments for the rest of the day. So we certainly appreciate everyone's uh, attendance today. Appreciate big thank you to the presenters and their work and getting the information out to everyone. Uh, it will probably be just a little bit of time before we publish the recording of this webinar, the Q&A and the resource documents. Uh, we will also uh, publish the presentation itself, the actual slides, if anyone would like to use those for presentations. And certainly if the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center can be of any assistance to anyone out there, we are ready and willing to help. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care, everyone.